the cannabinoid receptor is so abundant in the brain that you know anyone who has any background in neuroscience will stop and say, wow. Cannabis truly is a pharmacy and a flower. Survival comes with cooperation. Pleasure is healing. You're being a warrior of the weird. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. The endocannabinoid system is as gigantic as it is mysterious. You'd need a book as big as Moby Dick to explain everything we know about it, and everything we don't. Today's guest has been studying that system for decades, and he revels in its messy, unresolved complexity. Dr. Daniele Piomelli is a distinguished professor of anatomy and neurology at the University of California in Irvine. He's the director of the Center for the Study of Cannabis, editor-in-chief of the journal Cannabis and Cannabinoid Research, and he is one of the lions of the endocannabinoid field. Today, he talks about the major endocannabinoids, the analgesic or pain-killing property of cannabinoids, how our bodies respond to the phytocannabinoids from the plant, and how genetic variants might play a role in our personalities, as well as our national characters. And before we get started, we'll define a few terms that will get thrown around. In the brain, microglial cells are a type of immune cell that acts as a first line of defense in the central nervous system. The microglial cells are key for overall brain maintenance and they're highly influenced by the endocannabinoid system. On the neurons themselves are the presynaptic boutons and the postsynaptic spines, also known as dendritic spines. The key word here is synapse, that tiny space between neurons across which the neurotransmitters flow. And as Dr. Piomelli points out, the canonical idea in neuroscience is that information flows in one direction. Classic neurotransmitters like serotonin are released from a neuron's presynaptic bouton, which you might call their mouth, and then the neurotransmitters flow across the synapse to the next neuron's postsynaptic spine, which you might call their ears. What's special about the endocannabinoid 2AG is that it flows backwards across the synapse and tells the upstream neuron to calm down, we hear your message, ease off a bit. It's an incredibly important negative feedback loop that keeps the brain from overexcitation. Lastly, there is PEA. That one is of special interest to me because it's in our CV defense product. PEA is an endocannabinoid found in almost every cell type in the body. And it's another endocannabinoid with a lot of clinical research behind it. You can see more about the scientific history of PEA with a lecture by Dr. Piomelli that we link to in the episode notes and more about the cultural and medical history with a Minute with Miles segment, also in the episode notes. So if you want to learn about these processes in your body that are stimulated by taking cannabis and which regulates our healthy homeostatic functioning, then you'll learn a lot from this conversation with Dr. Daniele Piomelli. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Daniele Piomelli. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. You are renowned in the endocannabinoid science field, and I was wondering if you always wanted to be a scientist. No, not at all. Uh, in fact, uh, for a large part of my youth, I wanted to become an archaeologist. It just so it happens that at one point uh, I went to school of pharmacy for some practical reasons and uh, ended up loving the science and uh, just stuck with it. <laughs> Did you feel like there was any similarities between your early interest in archaeology and the kind of work that you're doing today? Yeah, I think they're conceptually the same. I, I used to dig out of the ground stuff that had been hidden for a couple of thousand years. And uh, now I'm trying to dig out of uh, nature, you know, whatever seems important, is, you know, with respect to the endocannabinoid field. So I think it's the same. It's the same mental process, really. And so you found this love of the more biochemical part of science. And then you got to work with doctors Eric Kandel and James Schwartz, who are some of the greats of this century. What was it like to start off doing research with people like this? Well, you have to understand that then you know better. I had no, I mean, I had done very, very little before. So this would, for me, was normality. You know, the uh, personalities of Eric and uh, Jimmy could not be more different, but they all had in common this crazy passion for for neuroscience, and I shared that. So uh, 
we got along pretty pretty well. I mean, with some little bumps, but it got along real well. And so then how did your uh, research shift from neuroscience into more focused on endocannabinoid science? Well, you know, the endocannabinoids are, you know, were born uh, inside of neuroscience in a sense, because uh, uh, even though now we know that the endocannabinoid system is uh, spread throughout the, the body, uh, back then, the, the thing you thought first when you thought about cannabinoids was the brain. And um, when I became involved, the cannabinoid receptor, the first one, that, which is now known as CB1, the cannabinoid receptor was uh, just discovered, it was just uh, cloned and identified, and uh, people started looking at where the cannabinoid receptor was in the brain. So uh, this is a receptor is so abundant in the brain that you know anyone who has any um, background in neuroscience will stop and say, wow, I mean, really, is so... Uh, it is so peculiar with its distribution and it's just sheer numbers. So that's that's why what I did, you know, when I, I, I thought it was really an interesting pharmacology to begin with. And second is very, very peculiar localization, so abundant localization in the brain. It uh, instantly had me hooked up and uh, had me hooked and uh, I, uh, I, you know, I started working on that. What was some of your early research on this subject? Well, I started off, you know, you mentioned my years at Columbia University. I, I was uh, working not on the endocannabinoid system, but on another uh, related uh, signaling system uh, in the brain. So the endocannabinoids are essentially fat-like molecules. They are, you know, generated from the fat layer that uh, uh, sheaths that covers every, every cell, right, the cell membrane. Uh, and um, I used to work on, uh, before working with the endocannabinoids, I used to work on another uh, fat-like molecule or lipid molecule that uh, is involved in signaling. And uh, my work with uh, Jimmy and, uh, and Eric was about the role of these molecules called arachidonic acid metabolites or eicosanoids in uh, uh, synaptic transmission. And uh, at the time, I was using a mollusk as a model called Aplesia uh, californica. It's one of the really interesting things about this to me is that you're studying lipids and fats in the brain. And people often think of more traditional neurotransmitters when they think about the brain. How different is a lipid signaling system compared to, to some of the other ones that we might hear about more often? Yeah, well, there is a, there is a thing in neuroscience. Neuroscientists don't really uh, like lipids very much. Uh, you know, we get trained uh, on stuff like glutamate and uh, GABA and and serotonin and dopamine. And then, you know, all of a sudden, here we are confronted with a signaling system that instead uses uh, lipids, uh, molecules that are typically associated with the structure of a membrane, right? But in reality, the last like 30 or 40 years have clearly demonstrated that lipids are really important in signaling. Uh, they differ from classical transmitters in a, in a variety of ways. Um, most transmitters I know of, uh, all of them actually, are stored in vesicles uh, and they are released when uh, electric signals allow the uh, you know the secretion of those vesicles. So the vesicles get uh, uh, fused with the membrane. The transmitter is released outside outside the cell. Um, that, that is not a mode of action that lipids can use because lipids are, uh, because they're lipids, they can diffuse out of stuff. They can, you know, they, they can diffuse by lateral diffusion on the membranes. So they have a lot of more, uh, greater latitude than, uh, um, than small molecules like glutamate or GABA uh, do. So the way lipid signaling works is that these, and this is true for almost every lipid signal I know of, with few exceptions, uh, in most cases, the lipid signal is preformed, so there is a precursor uh, in the membrane, usually stuck to a particular place of the cell, thanks to a bunch of, uh, of uh, you know, structures that, you know, scaffolding structures that stick it to a particular part of the cell, say the presynaptic bouton or the postsynaptic spine. So there is a precursor in there, and then... Uh, Receptors are activated by classical transmitters, say glutamate or acetylcholine, uh, 
And these receptors, metabotropic receptors, these are receptors that activate biochemical reactions. And in this case, the biochemical reaction they activate is the activation of enzymes uh, like phospholipases, for example, or other forms of lipases that will cleave this preformed stored lipid storages into something that is biologically active. And this is how the two main endocannabinoids are produced, but also other lipids are produced through the same logic. It's really not something that is unique to the endocannabinoids. The endocannabinoids have brought it to a point of really high specialization, and that can be best appreciated in something called retrograde signaling, where um, basically the, uh, the postsynaptic spine, which is at receiving end of the synaptic flow, the postsynaptic spine sends a lipid signal to the presynaptic bouton, uh, and that lipid signal is the endocannabinoid to arachinoyl glycerol or 2-AG. And that's that's a very special function, The correct? The, the retrograde transmission. It's only that and nitric oxide that helps calm down the receiving, the sending neuron? Yeah, there are some similarities between uh, the endocannabinoid 2-AG and nitric oxide. You, you, you brought up a very important correlation. Nitric oxide is a gas, but like the endocannabinoids, is uh, acting very locally. Uh, at uh, probably within the uh, diameter of one or two synapses, which is really what, you know, to a G can do, cannot go very far away from the side of its production. It gets right, quite quickly destroyed. And one other point about lipid signaling is, is it true that it's very nuanced in a sense compared to more classic signaling, where it can detect very small changes and have the cell respond accordingly? I don't know about that. It, the, the, you know, basically every type of signaling in the brain is fascinating and different in its uh, richness, richness. I think what is special about lipid signaling is that uh, uh, it, it allows for uh, fine-tuning, and if that's what you meant, absolutely. It allows for fine-tuning that uh, um, it's not impossible, but it's a little bit harder to do with, say, a peptide or a gas like nitric oxide. And the reason why I talk about fine tuning is because this is what uh, the whole phenomenon of uh, uh, retrograde signaling is all about. So in classical uh, transmission, um, the presynaptic bouton contains uh, the transmitter, right? And when an action potential arrives to the presynaptic bouton, a calcium gets in and neurosecretion occurs, and then the transmitter is released and activates receptors postsynaptically. So it's a very sort of structured uh, uh, organization with presynaptic going to postsynaptic. Um, but the, you know, the neuros, ne nervous system has developed, um, has evolved throughout the eons, a, a lot of uh, ways of controlling that. Uh, and the classical way is by... Um, uh, allowing the transmitter to also act on presynaptic receptors. So the same transmitter that activates postsynaptic receptors also works presynaptically. And that is very, very common. But the way the, uh, you know, the endocannabinoid wor endocannabinoids work is one step further. So the transmitter again activates a receptor that releases this sort of bre circuit breaker, this an endocannabinoid molecule, and now travels back. And I call it this, someone called it a circuit breaker, some, some, um, someone else a few years ago. And in a, se in a sense, it's, it's, a correct, it's a correct metaphor, but um, it doesn't always break. Sometimes it uh, decreases the release of transmitter, uh, so it acts as a real breaker. And in a few but important cases, it actually enhances the release of transmitter. So it's really a, a broad spectrum modulate, modulator. But this only works also for 2AG. We have to remember that the endocannabinoids that we know of are two, and anandamide has a very, one is called 2-AG, the other is called anandamide. Anandamide was the first one to be discovered. And anandamide actually has um, um, a, a different mode of action than 2-AG does. Could you tell us more about anandamide and what makes it unique? Well, anandamide is really unique because the, uh, the pathway, the lipid pathway that produces anandamide, and it's only incompletely, incompletely understood, that lipid pathway really is novel when uh, was discovered uh, 
back in 94, 95. No one believed us. Uh, what the heck is this? Uh, and and instead, 2AG is a little bit more standard. If you look at the textbook biochemistry of lipids, 2AG is right there, has been right there for 40, 50 years. Um, Anandamide is also unique in that, unlike 2AG, um, it, it is able, and we don't really understand well how, but it is able to get to a greater distance from the side of its production. Uh, so it is then to a G does. So to a G stays very much, you know, in a sort of point to point pattern of communication. It goes from post to pre. And that's about it. It gets uh, removed fairly quickly. It can probably reach a glial cell nearby, maybe another synapse really nearby, but it's limited in its uh, the extent uh, of its spread. An anamide is a little bit less limited, and uh, so it moves further. And for this reason, it's more like a volume lipid modulator. So by that, I mean something that spreads over a certain volume, uh, not very big. We're talking about micrometers. We're not talking about uh, millimeters, but um, maybe tens of micrometers, maybe hundreds of micrometers. But we are still talking about very small distances. But they are enough to uh, sort of influence an enemy to, for an enemy to influence uh, multiple synapses, to influence uh, you know, the, the nearby microglia, the nearby astroglia. So in that is different from 2AG. Um, there is also a lot more 2AG than there is an anamide, maybe 200 times more. Uh, and much of that is involved in signaling. So they're really two quite different transmitters. We're talking about the endocannabinoid system, and we think they all do one thing, but actually they, um, they divide their jobs. They have There is a pretty nice division of labor between these two uh, endocannabinoids. And so it, the the far-reaching effects of anandamide, is that why there is a theory that there's an anandamide transporter that's kind of helping it move around, but that isn't proven yet? So the anandamide transporter is actually probably more like transporters. Um, there are two kinds, uh, in my opinion. One that allows, and, and this is speculation, but we don't, unfortunately, we do not know really, but there is there must be one type that allows an anamide to and allows cells to recapture an anamide. And the reason for that is not so much to reuse it because the cells cannot use reuse an anamide, they must destroy it. But it, it's probably to avoid a spread in places uh, where it's not useful. So you have to appreciate that. Uh, let me give you an example. So of, of, if you were to to use some cannabis right now, your brain would be, you would be probably, you know, stoned or, or, you know, high. So that's not what the endocannabinoid system does. If the endocannabinoid system was let go uh, free, it, it, we will always be stoned or high. And maybe some of us are, but most of us are not. And um, so in order to avoid that, you need to keep everything, every component of the system in place. And so the transporter is one of the things that the neurons utilize to, uh, uh, recapture uh, an anamide and making sure that it doesn't go in the, wrong, in the wrong places. And by the way, also probably also 2AG is recaptured, though the mechanisms appear to be a little bit different. Um, then there are there might very well be proteins, uh, we call them chaperones, proteins that bind an anamide, bind 2AG, and allow them to go at greater distances, acting like, you know, like pretty much like a, like a boat, right? You know, in a, in a sea of water, we imagine, you know, the cytosol of the cell, the inside of the cell, to be mostly watery, and you know, and this, you know, these guys sh uh, shuffle the endocannabinoids from one place to another. You know, there is a lot of speculation about that, but we don't really know. We don't really know for sure. And so, anandamide is often called the the neurotransmitter of bliss. And you mentioned how some people might be more stoned. Do you think, with the speculations of what we know about the different genetic variants of say, our CB1 receptors and the endocannabinoid system machinery, that some people are just naturally more naturally stoned, and that's why they act the way that they act? Yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. So first, let me, let me say that the, uh, the name, the transmitter of bliss, comes from its name itself, because when Bill Devane and Rafi Meshulam isolated uh, an anamide back in 92, I think Bill called it uh, uh, an anandamide because he was very fond of everything uh, Indian and Sanskrit. He studied Sanskrit at the uh, University of Jerusalem. Uh, 
and uh, ananda in Sanskrit means bliss. So in reality, what ananda might does and what we understand ananda might does is not really to give us any sense of bliss, but rather to help us cope with really stressful uh, situations, uh, psychological or psychosocial stress, uh, but also physical stress in some uh, in some cases, uh, and probably also it helps us uh, uh, in dealing with social uh, social behavior. We are social animals, and an animal appears to be playing a role in social reward, the pleasure that we feel when we meet, encounter, and, and deal with other members of our species. So it's not really the bliss molecule. So it's interesting, the genetic variance uh, is, is really fascinating. There is uh, an enzyme that, uh, this is a protein that helps destroy uh, an endomite, and it's called fatty acid amide hydrolase, FAAH, or FA. And uh, there is a variant, a human variant in, uh, um, in, the, in, in, the, in the FA gene, that contains, uh, it's slightly slightly changed, it's really a very small change, but the, the protein is less functional. So it gets destroyed more quickly and uh, individuals who carry this variant have less FA. So if you have less FA, you have more anandamide, right? Um, and so one would, it's interesting, this is a sort of a natural experiment that allows us to ask the question, uh, um, what happens if you have more anandamide? Are you high? Are you some? What is the difference? And so, as you would expect from what I was telling you before, that uh, um, the role of anandamide in in stress and in uh, and in social behavior, people who have that variant tend to be to have lower reaction to stress under experimental conditions. So you put them in a lab in a lab setting and you challenge them with some slightly stressful stimulations and they respond better than individuals who instead have normal levels of FA, so lower levels of anandamide. So that is suggest that the, the suggestion is that in these individuals who have more anandamide tend to be more capable of dealing with stress, right? And it's a funny, funny story, but you know, there is such a thing as happiness research. And the paper uh, came out in a journal entitled Journal of Happiness Research where they showed where the, uh, uh, this particular FAS-NEP, this FAS variant, in, is localized nation, in, in various nations of the world, right? So there are nations that have a higher uh, um, uh, level of, of, uh, of this, higher frequency, rather, of this particular SNP, of this particular variant, and nations who have lower, that have lower. And it's funny because uh, in Europe, for example, the nations that have the higher uh, rate of this SNP are Scandinavian nations. They're also well known for being particularly happy. And nations instead that uh, like Southern, Southern European nations uh, uh, who are well known for their complaining ab- uh, habits um, uh, have, have lower levels of this, uh, of this, of this SNP. I mean, I say this tongue in cheek because I'm not fully convinced these are all, of course, you know, uh, associational studies. They're not causative studies, but uh, they, they're well done. These are well done studies and uh, one can sit there and look at them and, you know, everyone can interpret them the way they want. But it's interesting that this variant should be so, uh, so, uh, frequent in the population. We're talking about up to 10, 15% of the population carrying this variant. So it must have some kind of uh, adaptive value to be uh, maybe a little bit happier, especially if the weather is not as good as uh, in, in some parts of the world, right? So it might be a little bit of a chicken or the egg. Exactly. You know, it gives, a, it gives an evol- evolutionary advantage. I guess if you're happier, you get to meet, I mean, to meet more girls, right? Um. At CV Sciences, we love our full-spectrum hemp products. But for some people with sensitive jobs or sensitive systems, they want something with 0% THC. So we create a line of products called Happy Lane. Made with CBD from hemp grown in Kentucky, we have gummies, we have chews, we have liquids, we have soft gels, and we have the always beloved CBD roll-ons for applying to your skin. Everything is non-GMO, vegan, purity tested, and manufactured in the United States. So when life has you wound up, tense, agitated, antsy, uptight, jittery, or jumpy, try our Happy Lane line of CBD products. For 25% off, use the coupon code LEXFILES at pluscbd.com.
One thing that's fascinating about what you've been saying about anandamide is how many mysteries there are still around it. There's labs like yours who've been studying it for a long time and lots of other labs in the world, and yet we still don't know the complete synthesis pathway for it. We don't know about how it gets transported around. Are there great mysteries that you would love to just be able to know that are right there, out of reach in endocannabinoid science? Oh, yeah, there are quite a few, and I don't want to bother bore the listener with all those, but there are, there, there are really quite a few. And again, it goes to what I was saying before about neuroscientists having a problem with lipids and fat, because um, some of these are so obvious. You know, one would like to understand exactly how an animal is produced, for example. And why? Well, because if you understand that, you understand when and where is generated for what purpose, Right. And also, uh, if you have a full understanding of the all the enzymatic steps, you know, underpinning an enzyme production, then also you can localize them in the brain. So you identify a particular enzyme, and then you go and say, okay, that's where the enzyme is. That's probably the function it's serving. We we have some of that information, but we are still not there. I would say we still have about fifty to sixty percent. If you know, at least based on our current knowledge of stuff that we need to understand and uh, understand better, and I think that has in, in, quite interesting consequences. But, but as I said before, you, I, I think now the field is more uh, is more focused on something else, something more uh, I think less scientifically interesting, but clearly more societally important. Which is, can we leverage this new knowledge about the endocannabinoid system to generate? medications are helpful to the public. And um, of course, there is an element of scientific discovery there too, actually quite a large one, but um, is something that uh, is essentially involves pharmaceutical discovery at this point. There are inhibitors for the various enzymes of endocannabinoid degradation. There are at least two of them. There are most important five mentioned and another one called monosylglycerol lipase or MGL, for uh, which works for 2-AG. And they're now excellent inhibitors for both. And the idea is that uh, these inhibitors could be leveraged to um, enhance the, uh, uh, the helpful protective properties of the endocannabinoid system, for example, in pain, for example, in anxiety, and without the side effects that are uh, caused by uh, direct activation of cannabinoid receptors with THC. There are issues with direct activation of receptors. One of them is that, well, first of all, you activate receptors you don't want to necessarily activate. And second, when you activate the receptors, they tend to dislike it. So they tend to start uh, uh, acting up. And, you know, if you activate them too much, they will shut down. You know, just like, you know, uh, a kid who doesn't like to be bothered, you know, she will shut down, he will shut down. And so at the end of the day, you end up having a, a, the opposite result that you wanted to achieve, Right. So uh, th those are interesting areas, of course, but in terms of uh, basic science discoveries, I think we really, th we have interesting questions that really might eventually have also therapeutic applications, but they don't right now. Uh, in addition to uh, what I mentioned before, there is the fact that an anamide and 2-AG don't come alone. They are not, uh, uh, you know, lonely uh, uh, signals. Um, oh, we have an anamide, we have 2-AG, and then around we have the desert. No. They actually come in, in families, and there are multiple families of lipids that look like an anamide uh, or look like 2-AG, but they're not quite uh, the same because they don't activate the cannabinoid receptor. So they don't do cannabinoid stuff, but they work where they can be produced and degraded through similar pathways. So they must be interacting, right? Maybe synergistically, which means that you know they cooperate to, for a common purpose, or maybe antagonistically, which means that one is pushing and the other one is pulling. But um, we don't know that, but it clearly is important uh, to understand how these different cognate uh, related uh, lipid signals all work together to, for achieving some, you know, presumably biological good, right? So that, that, that to me is another interesting mystery. And it's also a great lead in to one of the areas that you knew better than almost anyone else on the planet, uh, PEA, the, the endocannabinoid neurotransmitter that has a lot of therapeutic potential and has been studied a lot in humans. And you were one of the early people. Uh, what first attracted you to studying PEA? <laughs> well, thanks for asking. That's, that's a funny story. 
But uh, um, many, many years ago, a colleague and friend of mine and I were working on uh, the effects of anandamide in pain. And uh, back then, there were very few tools, uh, experimental tools that we could use. Like there were no, um, not, a, not very many an antagonists, etc. So, or there were no, uh, you know, mouse models that had no receptor, for example, was really the beginning of this whole thing. And uh, so we were looking for a, a control that we could use for anandamide. And anandamide was producing this really profound analgesic effect. And we said, okay, we're going to use something that looks like anandamide, but clearly does not activate cannabinoid receptors. And uh, we put, picked palmitilithanolamide uh, or PEA, which you mentioned before. So PEA looks like an anandamide. They have a common general structure, but PEA is different enough that uh, it has really no uh, affinity for the cannabinoid receptor, so it doesn't bind that receptor. And we were pretty sure that uh, you know we would give it to animals and nothing would happen. And instead, very much to our surprise, the uh, PEA was a lot more analgesic uh, than we expected. It actually was exactly as analgesic as an anandamide was. So that kind of put, a, a, you know, I'm a really critical person that I think that comes with the job. So, you know, we were doing this study and I said, okay, stop, stop, stop. We can't, we can't go on. This, this must be something nonspecific. What, what the heck are we looking at? Is this anesthesia? Whatever. We, we looked at all sorts of different possibilities. There was in the early days, it was 98. So uh, uh, I will just fast forward. Uh, eventually, we discover that uh, this interesting effect of PA, which is analgesic effect, which wasn't known before. PA had been known for actually quite a few years, quite a few decades, primarily because as an anti-inflammatory compound. But analgesia is one thing; anti-inflammation is a completely different thing. And this effect was truly selective analgesic. So uh, we found the receptor that uh, is responsible for that effect which is a strange receptor. It's, got, it's not like CB1, it's a nuclear receptor. So it's a receptor that actually moves through the nucleus and regulates the transcription of genes. And, uh, and that receptor explains, I, I, I think, um, 90 to 95% of the effects of, uh, of analgesic effects of PA and also anti-inflammatory effects of PA. That was the work of one of my grad students. Um, so now, many years later, this was, again, in the 1980s, 1998. Uh, years later, uh, PA returned, uh, you know, uh, in vogue in Europe. Um, they started selling it as an anti-inflammatory, analgesic, uh, you know, with good, you know, with good, um, you know, clinical background. It's not perfect. Uh, in fact, the, I don't think it's conclusive at all, but uh, there is pretty robust evidence that uh, PA is indeed analgesic. And, uh, and anti-inflammatory, not, not really good drug because it gets destroyed very quickly. It, it, has, uh, it doesn't have those nice drug-like properties you like in a medicine, but, you know, is good enough for a number of inflammatory conditions, at least based on the clinical data we have so far. What would be the most clinical, interesting applications, you think, for PEA? So th that is that is really the question, isn't it, right? So I think where people are looking at, and this is not my opinion, I think it's the opinion of most experts in the field, they're looking at uh, uh, chronic pain, neuropathic pain, particularly at uh, peripheral neuropathies, at, at conditions where there is um, uh, either visible or invisible damage to the peripheral nerves that uh, are painful, is painful, and... Uh, and, you know, conditions like this have shown in clinical trials, in conditions like this, PA has been shown in clinical trials to be, um, to have some uh, some efficacy. You know, do we have, you know, the uh, smoking gun? No, we don't have the smoking gun yet. And one of the difficulties in working with PA is that it's really not a very, uh, it's not really a very good drug. You know, we, as drug medicine, we usually think of something that, you know, we give to a patient, the patient takes it, it goes into her system and uh, uh, distributes nicely and uh, works for a couple of hours and then disappears, right? So that, that is the normal uh, life uh, time of a lifespan, if you wish, of a, of a good medicine. Um, but with PEA, it's different because it's a natural compound, right? So the body has developed all sorts of ways of destroying it. 
So we have to overcome <laughs> sort of these uh, self-destruction mechanisms. So we need to give a lot of the compound. And sometimes some, I think some individuals uh, destroyed more quickly than others do. And so maybe those in which is more effective are those who are actually um, uh, maybe less able to remove it, less able to metabolize it quickly. I don't know. I'm just speculating. But that's it's right now evidence for its efficacy is there, I think, all in all. But it's, uh, it's really not, as I said, not the smoking gun. They would say, oh, my God, clearly this is good for this, 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 and that condition. And on the biochemical level, is it difficult to study because it affects the nuclear receptors and can change the transcription of a bunch of genes and all of a sudden you have a bunch more proteins in the, in the system and it can be hard to tell what's happening and what's doing the good? No, that, that is really not, not, not a problem so much. Um, PA is complicated in its mechanism of action and that's another area where we don't have full knowledge because, for example, PEA causes almost immediately an analgesic effect. And that it almost by definition excludes a transcriptional mechanism because in a transcriptional mechanism, PEA needs to travel to the nucleus, needs to activate its receptor, which is P bar alpha, which is, is housed between the, the cytosol and the nucleus. And in the nucleus then, you know, turns on the transcription of certain genes, turns off the transcription of other genes, and acts in other ways to control protein expression. And those things usually take minutes, if not hours, in many cases, hours. So the fast, the immediate fast analgesic effect is mysterious. It's not unheard of because, you know, for example, steroid hormones have also this classical, for example, estrogen, estrogens have classical rapid effects, but we have not yet identified the uh, the mechanism through this which this happened is piper alpha mediated because if you remove piper alpha or you block piper alpha the effect's gone but how does piper alpha do that is unknown so in this is complicated but i don't think it's less complicated or more complicated rather than an anamide these are all complex things you know biology is not is not is not uh, you know newtonian mechanics is actually really complicated and that's one of the things you mentioned earlier I w wanted to ask about with things like THC and CBD, where we think of them acting on the endocannabinoid system, but in reality, they also affect a whole bunch of other systems like serotonin and endorphins and dopamine and glutamate. And I think it'd be hard for us lay people to understand sometimes what's mediating the positive effect of these. And so what do you think are some of the most important actions that the phytocannabinoids have in terms of their effects on us? So that's a complex question because phytocannabinoids are, there are many of them, at least 140, 145 at my last count, and um, they're all different. So they share a common name because they all come from the cannabis plant, but uh, their structures are not completely different. If you look at them, you recognize resemblances, but they don't act the same way. So THC activates CB1, CB2 receptors. CBD, which is the other big guy you know, in the plant, um, does not, does not really direct do that, directly do that. They may be modulating CB1 a little bit, but most of the effects are probably carried out through other systems, other mechanisms. One thing that CBD does, for example, it blocks this enzyme FA, which I mentioned before, so it will increase the levels of N not just the endogenous cannabinoids proper, but also these other, you know, paracannabinoid molecules like PA and, uh, and so on and so forth. So th these are very complex actions, and um, we cannot just encapsulate them in a, in a, in, a, in one tiny box. So you know, your viewers who are not specialists, uh, I'll tell them that uh, if you guys are confused, well, you know, welcome to the club. It's a it's a real it's a really difficult pharmacological pharmacological questions question but you know my my views and it's my view is that uh, uh, when you look at cannabis uh, and you think about cannabis the way we have thought about cannabis for the past uh, you know <laughs> quite a few years since uh, you know we started humans as humans started to uh, to uh, deal with the plant the major effects are mediated by THC THC drives the pharmacology of cannabis then you know so it happens that this plant is an interesting little uh, little chemical industry. It's capable of generating all these 
interesting molecules, and some of them, like CBD, also have effects. But I'd like to remind your viewers, your, your listeners, that the classical cannabis, the cannabis that people pot and the weed that people smoke and use, that is driven by THC. You pull out THC from that, and no one would use it. It would be like, okay, some kind of oregano or sorts. Oh, it smells good, whatever. But it's not going to really uh, affect your brain. CBD, of course, has psychoactivity. As people have shown that it has uh, effects that are, say, reducing anxiety, maybe reducing some symptoms of psychosis. These are all scattered information. Please, they, these are not proven facts, but there are clinical studies suggesting that what I just said is based on reality. And of course, recent studies have shown that it's anti-epileptic in children, right? Those are solid studies that have been conducted with proper uh, controls. Um, so there is value in CBD, but um, it is not that CBD is the cousin of THC. They're two two different, you know, they're distant relatives who maybe know each other, but sometimes maybe antagonize each other or collaborate with one another, but really are not um, are not working through the same system, you know. And the same is true for anything else: cannabigerol, cannabichromine, you know, cannabivarin, divarin, all these other. The names are all very nice, by the way. They all sound great. Um, but um, we know very, very little about the way they work. And so just two last questions then, and this will uh, tie into what you were just saying. It's interesting that you do this academic research that in one sense will never be finished and has no answers, but you also work in business and you have, I think, over 40 patents and you've started three different biotech companies. What's it like for you to be working in academia, but also to be working in the world of business? To be trying to translate all this work that we are doing in the lab, in mice, in rats, trying to translate it into real um, useful medical knowledge uh, is important um, because we are, we are, scientists are so, uh, are so fortunate that, you know, we are funded to really enjoy, you know, have fun really because we have fun in the work we, we do. Uh, so I feel that is, uh, is uh, an obligation for, for me to help whenever we have some technology related to the endocannabinoid system that could be potentially useful to the, uh, to the public out there to try and move it there. And if you want to do that, you, that's something that now it's no longer academic, right? It's more industrial. So you need to have to, you need to take that step further uh, and uh, it requires different skills. So uh, some of us enjoy that, some of us enjoy them less. Um, I, I think it's an interesting set of skills to know. Um, I enjoy the process, but it's also very, very frustrating because unlike science where we can control things and we can experiment, uh, try once, twice, three times until we understand and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, but we have a, 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 clear, a, a clear answer. Unlike that, the clinical world is a lot more confused. It costs a lot more, uh, sometimes in a justified way, sometimes not. It's much more costly. And for this reason, it is uh, also um, like kind of a one-shot deal. So if you, if, you're, if you say, okay, I think a fine inhibitor will work for this particular condition, you better be right. Because if it doesn't work for that condition, then... Uh, then, you know, people, oh, okay, it doesn't work. But it could be working for another condition, right? But you don't know that, and you will never know that because you screwed up the first time, and so there is no, no turning around. So it is a, um, it's frustrating that way. And this is a good scenario. Bad scenarios are when you have strange investors or, you know, uh, crazy CEOs, you know, th th this stuff, all this stuff happens all the time. If you have a view of the market as being something rational with a lot of rational, rational actors in it, well, uh, let me, let me, I, I have something to, for you to buy. I have something I want to sell you. And so that, uh, that leads to the last question. For the future of drugs to modulate the endocannabinoid system for health, what would you be most excited about? <laughs> well, you know, I would be most excited about anything that works in the clinic, whatever the uh, the indication. Uh, I, I happen to think that conditions like uh, anxiety, particularly social anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, pain are important conditions 
they, they make the life of people who suffer from them very, very difficult. Um, and it would be great if the endocannabinoid system helped um, those individuals. But I won't lie to you, uh, if a um, fine inhibitor turns out to be, or an MGL inhibitor or anything else, turns out to be effective in any important human uh, medical condition, I would be excited no matter what, you know, uh, because it, it, there is nothing like the feeling of when you've worked on something for 30 years, there is nothing like the feeling that you can say, you know, you can point to something and say, okay, this actually is helping people. And it came from, you know, maybe directly or maybe indirectly through the work that uh, we started, me and my colleagues started uh, 30 years ago. I, I think it, it's a good feeling. Um, maybe I'm I don't know, maybe I'm weird, but that's that's the way I feel about this stuff. Well, thank you for all your work doing this research and for getting it out there in the world. And thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you, Lex. Thank you so much. Okay, until next time. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, check out pluscbdoil.com, listen on all the podcast platforms, or see us on YouTube. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com. And please follow the podcast on Twitter at The Lex Files Show, where I try to keep it fun. If you enjoyed this program, please give us a like on your favorite platform or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne, the YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. Thank you to Tina Molnar and Jasmine Morris for the visuals. And the music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. Our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.